This is Indie Live Radio and we're about to broadcast the next in our Yes Group Spotlight series. And this week his spotlight is on the Aberdeen Independence Movement, or AIM for short. The Aberdeen folk got together a couple of speakers, Stacey Bradley and Doug Daniels, and between them they set about debunking all the myths around postal voting. They tell us how the postal voting system actually works, they tell us what postal vote agents are, how the, th- how the votes are counted, those, and then they get to those myths. You know, like the one about Ruth Davidson knowing in advance what the postal voting had been? Did she really know in advance? Then there's one about how postal votes get sent down to England to be counted. Nah, surely not. Stacey and Doug do a really good job of debunking all the myths. Not everything's a myth. People have some reasonable reservations about using the postal voting system and they talk about those as well. And then there's a set of very good questions from the AIM audience. Hope you enjoy this. Just about to start. Hello everyone. You are all welcome to our Facebook live event today. We are excited to discuss postal voting, a topic that has attracted a lot of attention and we feel it has generated so much interest um, due to the um, recent US elections where it was clear that it was something that did help the Biden campaign. Um, so we discuss every uh, before every election, the Aberdeen Independence Movement launches a campaign to encourage postal voting because we do feel that it's an important democratic process. But we are we do face challenges every time, and this is due to the fact that there's so much myths around postal voting, and there's so much mistrust, so much misinformation that we um, aim to um, address here. And our main aim is to let everyone know that it is a safe method to vote. It is very important and not using postal votes only helps the unionist, unionist side. Now I can go with this retro, rhetoric, sorry, because we are a pro-independence campaign and we do believe that postal voting is going to be a very important part um, in this election, this forthcoming election that could actually help us secure a pro-independence majority because as it stands right now, the unionists are the ones who benefit from postal voting. So our two main guests, we have two very experienced people um, who will be be discussing and addressing your questions today. Um, We have Stacey Bradley, so I'll just switch to speaker view and we'll have Stacey Bradley um, and then we have also Doug Daniel. So um, I'll just introduce Stacey Bradley first, just let her talk for five minutes about postal voting and what um, she hopes, what key um, issues she hopes to address here. And then we'll move on to Doug Daniel. So, um, Stacey Bradley, please. Thank you, Fatima. Um, yeah, I totally agree. This is a, an incredibly important uh, topic for us to be discussing. My experience uh, directly of postal voting is as an election agent and a postal voter myself. Um, I've been an election agent for a number of campaigns and referendums and seen the process end to end from having completed my own registration form to completing my own ballot to watching the process. Um, as to how the uh, ballots are are, uh, handled and um, analysed and then moved through the process to be counted at the the final count event. So from my perspective, having supported uh, candidates through that election process, my uh, focus has been on trying to sign up as many postal voters as is possible. Um, And doing that, Obviously, my focus has been as uh, an election agent for SNP candidates, so the the push has been to ensure that supporters and uh, potential voters for the SNP are being signed up to those postal votes and ensuring in uh, elections like the Holyrood election that we have coming up that both votes are cast for for the SNP in in this instance from my experience. So I think the important thing for me to, to highlight in, in a number of ways is the fact that no one knows what's going to happen on polling day. And I think this time round, that's more of a fact than it ever has been. Um, you know, a lot of people, we, we find that when we have adverse weather conditions, you know, if it happens to be a rainy day, much less people come out to the polls, for example. But also we all have personal life situations that can be entirely in flux and unexpected. Um, personal experience, I had a couple of months 
ago, I was uh, messaging a friend while walking down the stairs and accidentally slipped and twisted my ankle. Had that been Poland Day, I would not have made it to the polls that day um, as, as, a, as an activist, as somebody who's actively involved in politics. I think it's, it's important for me to understand that while I would never ever miss a poll under normal, normal circumstances, and most of the people who are tuning into this call are probably in the same boat, sometimes circumstances override our intentions. And no matter how hard we plan for our vote, there's, there's always circumstances that can get in the way. Again, referring to, to personal experience, the current situation is one that we cannot ignore in, in this case. And I think it's, it's more important than ever that people consider the, the importance of postal voting. Um, I woke up this morning uh, to, to a normal-ish day and I have an eight-year-old son who said, mommy, I don't feel very well. And I'm like, okay, well, we'll get breakfast, we'll get sorted, we'll get on with the working day. So forgive me if I'm referring back to notes here because my intention for today was to get through my working day and put together a nice presentation based off the sheet of notes that I have for, for you guys to enjoy this evening. Unfortunately, my day didn't go to plan because my wee boy has ended up quite poorly with a bit of a temperature and had to go for a COVID test. So I now find myself at home self-isolate. And again, had this been Poland day, we would be in a situation where I'm not able to go and cast my vote. If I had a postal vote, it would have been sent a fortnight ago and wouldn't have been a concern. So when we consider these, these circumstances that none of us expect to be facing at the moment, it really, really brings home the point that we, we just don't know what's going to happen next. So we need to be really, really considering the unpredictability of the situation that we're in. Whilst considering the wider situation that, that we can find ourselves in at any polling day and how important having that backup option is. So postal votes mean that your vote is cast in advance. So it makes it easier for you to be able to plan that vote. Yeah, I could have had the best intentions today to go to the polling station and, and life's taken that option away from me. However, if I had a postal vote, I could still sit and fill it out and make arrangements for that to be posted um, in, in due course, even if I am having to self-isolate because of the COVID situation that we find ourselves in. So it makes it much easier and, and gives us much more time to consider uh, how we can plan that vote. So you can also, if you choose to, keep, your, keep hold of your, your uh, postal vote and take it to the polling station on the day of, of the ballot. There's nothing to prevent you doing that. Obviously, when we're talking about the current situation with the pandemic, that's maybe something that you would want to reconsider. Um, however, you know, it is an option that, that you have um, at this time. I would strongly advise against that, though, because um, obviously Royal Mail will be under pressure at, at, through the, the postal voter period. And there's discussions saying that we can, the Royal Mail system thinks that they might be able to handle up to and beyond 40% of current voters uh, signing up for postal votes. So the more people that will sign up, the greater that process then becomes. And there's all sorts of uh, aspects of how the, the count and the poll are, are actually going to happen that are still in, in discussion that might mean counting over several days um, due to the current pandemic situation, which then takes some of that pressure off Royal Mail. So ensuring that we're getting our postal votes through the system as soon as possible takes some of that burden off as well, near, near the polling date. So I think people are more likely to vote if the ballot comes to them rather than them having to go to the ballot. That's been proven time and time again that you know if, if it arrives through your doorstep and all you've got to do is, is put it back through that's much when it suits you when you happen to be passing you know when when you, you're near a post box rather than having to make the special effort to go and vote people are much more likely to and we've got statistics to, to prove that people are much more likely to vote in those circumstances also from a sort of election agent activist point of view getting out the vote on polling day can be difficult for us independence supporting parties and individuals at the best of times. Um, but it's going to be even more difficult with some of the situations that we're talking about where people might be isolating, where people might be less comfortable to actually go into places where people are moving throughout uh, the day. I think by, by securing the postal vote, it's, it's going to be the safest way to consider protecting one another from the virus as we move forward. But once people have already voted, that then takes the pressure off our activists to ensure that people are getting out on the day. It's less pressure on local polling stations. It makes it easy, easier to, to maintain social distancing, uh, safety and hygiene as, as we deal with the pandemic situation as well. So the wider COVID issues are negated by 
to, to a greater extent by more people signing up for postal votes. I mean, obviously they're, they're important for every election where pro-independence and, and SNP voting counts, but it's even more critical in this year's Holyrood election where we need an SNP majority to secure our Scottish government's push for independence. You know, this, this, this is critical and, and that's certainly the, the perspective that I'm coming at this from. And as Fatima rightly said in the introduction, you know, we've seen that uh, President Trump has been overthrown by the postal voting system. You know, this is a really powerful tool that we have at our fingertips. Uh, you know, those were pro those who are processing our ballots are just as likely to be pro independence, pro SNP supporters and voters as as any of the rest of us are. You know, at least half of them are, are going to be from our side of the fence. So people who might have concerns about the safety of the process need to consider that people will be scrutinising each other as they handle our ballots and move through that process itself, which Doug will come on to, to bust some of the myths around about. But that's just a wee push that I have to put in when I have these conversations with people. There are people just like us that are doing their job as well, who will have political preferences and political leanings in, in various different directions. So please remember that, you know, it's not all it's not all one sided and, and it's actually quite difficult to corrupt a system when everyone is watching one another. But please don't buy into the myths. I think it's really, really important that postal voting worked for Biden in America. It can work for us here. We need to put our faith and our trust in the system. And that's how it works for our opposition. They have faith and trust in the system. They know that it works and they generally win on postal votes. Um, you know, certainly where I come from, down here in the south of Scotland, um, you know, the postal votes are always the ones where I'm, I see some some of my local activists that I work with on the call here who, you know, you guys will remember me saying when those postal box, boxes come in, don't be disheartened because those are the ones that we tend to lose because a lot of independent support and people seem to have an idea relative to postal votes that they are unsafe and I can, you know, those conversations I'm sure will come out through this uh, and I'm happy to have them but the fact of the matter is if, if we don't use them they don't work for us we need to be using them and making sure that they, they work for us so I'm going to finish with just a couple of wee bits before passing across to Doug so postal voting closes in 77 days time that is not long but it is long enough for you to seriously consider how important this is going to be in this election and seriously consider how maybe some of the scenarios that I've outlined from my own personal experience today could, could affect you in, in the coming weeks and those coming 77 days and think whether or not you want to risk not being able to have your voice heard at this critical election. It's always important, but especially at this time, postal voting is the safest way to ensure that you are able to cast your ballot in any circumstances and that your voice is heard. But in this situation, please, please, please don't lose your opportunity to vote at this critical election. It's so important that we secure our SNP majority and that we ensure we've got our, our, our processes in place for securing our independence. So I'll pass you across to Doug and I'm quite happy to take questions as we go. I see stuff popping up in the chat, so I'll maybe try and answer some of these as, as we go through. But I'll let Doug come on to some of the myths um, that, that, that fly around that, that we have some answers for and some discussions that we might want to have. So thank you for, for listening to me for a wee while. I'll let Doug Daniel come on. Doug, are you okay? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah so as Stacey says, uh, I'm going to go through some of the, kind of the main myths that folk have with post, uh, postal voting. Uh, it, it, it's the same kind of few that come up all time and time again. You know, there's loads of arguments come up with, uh, folk come up with against it, but there, there's a few that anytime you try and promote postal voting on Twitter or something like that, you get the same ones back time and time again. So I'm going to try and go through them. Uh, just now, and hopefully you'll be convinced. Uh, although you know, sometimes, once you got an idea in your head, it's very difficult to shift it. Sometimes, and I think it's particularly true with things like uh, the situation here. Um, a lot, a lot of the myths from postal voting uh, arise from the the twenty fourteen referendum. Basically, um, a lot of it was just you know people were to. Uh, find answers for why Scotland could possibly vote not to run its own affairs, which to all of us is just a bizarre thing, but it happened. Uh, but people were wanting answers to why, and there were people who, for whatever reasons uh, they have, 
decided to kind of take advantage of that and feed people these false stories to kind of try and make people, you know, feel better. Oh, you, it was stolen. You know, it was nefarious deeds. It wasn't just that we'd lost kind of thing. So I, I think that's a lot of the reason why these myths have perpetuated and stuck with us because it, they're a bit comforting almost uh, to think that it wasn't our fault that we lost kind of thing. Um, but the first one, um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll talk about how the post vote process works. I think that kind of helps just to show how much scrutiny there actually is in it, because uh, it, it, you know th there is a fair bit of watching uh, what's happening through the process. So uh, the, the first thing is when you register for a postal vote, um, you get this form, you fill in your name, address, your date of birth, how long you want a postal vote for, and you provide your signature as well. And that's an important part of this. So you do that, you send your form off to the, uh, the council, and this means the council has got your details. They've got a copy of your signature, which will be used at a later point. Um, and that's you registered a postal voter. So when it comes to actual votes, um, you get a postal vote pack, and this pack has the ballot paper, which is the exact same ballot paper that's used in the full election. Uh, you've got to think of a postal voting statement, which is where you fill in some details, including your date of birth and the signature that you provided. Um, and then you've got two envelopes. You've got a smaller one, which is called envelope A, which you put the ballot paper in. And you've got another one called envelope B, which is a bigger one, where you put that envelope and your postal voting statement in. So the thing that you actually deliver to the council will be an envelope containing this postal voting statement, which is to kind of show that the person who filled in the ballot is a person who they have done their record, and also a ballot paper that's in another envelope, right? <clears throat> so you send that back to council, uh, and then in a run-up to the election, they have these things called postal vote opening sessions. Um, now, this is sort of not having to do all this on the day of the election. Uh, the actual counting of postal votes happens at the same time as all the other uh, the votes. Um, if anyone here has ever been to uh, a count for an election, uh, you know you get there for ten o'clock. Obviously, the the ballot box, the ballot station's shut at ten, so they can't have the votes there straight away. So for the first kind of wee bit, uh, they count the postal votes that they've got there ready and waiting. So that kind of keeps folk occupied, basically. These postal votes opening sessions that they have in the run up to that election. The important thing about that is that all the interested parties, so in ele an election, it's all the, the political parties, in a referendum, it's the two sides of the argument, they are invited to uh, appoint postal vote agents, uh, and postal opening agents, I can't remember, but it, basically it's activists that they trust who go along to these sessions to scrutinise a process, because the best way to make sure that nothing's going wrong is to have all the people who are most interested in the result going their way watching every single step of the process like a hawk. Because if anyone's going to notice anything that's wrong, it's the folk who are going to lose out if they lose, basically. Uh, don't know if that makes sense. So it's a really it's a really transparent process, and I don't think folk understand quite how you know how scrutinized it is. I think this is part of the reason why all these, uh, these, these kind of theories persist. But anyway, you have these post voting sessions where the post votes come in um, and there's a strict process they go through. So first of all, these big envelopes, envelope B, they will take them out of their box and the count number they've got. So at the end of that, they know exactly how many postal votes were submitted to them and they keep a record of that number uh, for later on. Once they've done that, they actually open the envelopes and they do that, they remove the postal vote statement, which is the thing that you put your, uh, your date of birth and that you signed. And they check that the number on that matches the number that's on the little envelope that's inside the envelope. So that means that, uh, you know, someone hasn't just kind of made up a, you know, a, it makes sure it's not a fake vote, basically. So numbers have to match. That's the first thing. And then if the numbers match, they then check to see that the signature and the date of birth are on that ballot paper. Uh, not about sort of the voting statement. 
So that's another check they've got there. And then assuming that those checks are both, uh, you know, ticked off, then the returning officer, who's the person who's in charge of the whole process, they have to verify that the signature and the date of birth on that postal voting statement match what the council has on record. And at the end of this, if there's any rejected statements, the postal vote itself just gets rejected, basically. So you have to make sure that if you do register for a postal vote, don't, you know, make sure it's your actual signature, don't do something stupid, because, or if you do, make sure you remember what it was, because uh, otherwise you won't get your vote counted. So then they know how many of the postal votes were, how, how many of them are actually valid, basically. Now, at this point, they don't actually know what's on the postal, uh, the, the ballot form itself. They don't know that yet, because they've not looked at the ballot paper. And they won't look at the ballot paper until the actual day of the count, because they're not interested in that at this point. They're just interested in whether it's a valid postal vote. So they've got all these envelopes, which is the, the little envelope that's got the ballot paper in it. They separate them from all the other stuff so that they then, you know, the folk who are opening up these envelopes can't associate them with the person who, you know, uh, has uh, sent it in because the, it, it's important that it's as difficult as possible to associate a vote with a person because it's just one of the, the, the main things about a, a, a fair democratic system, basically. Um, so the staff then open these little envelopes and they try as much as possible to take the, the ballot paper out of the envelope and put it face down so that folk can't see what's on it. But of course, that doesn't always happen because you know there's a you'd be amazed with the amount of ways folk find to do things the wrong way. So there's instructions in your postal ballot thing to kind of tell you how to put your uh, your ballot paper into the envelope, but folk find ways of not doing the right way. So you know they'll maybe put it in the fold it the wrong way around. So when you take it out, you can see where the X is and stuff like that, right? And that's an important point uh, for what I'm going on to go into. Uh, but they do try their best to make sure that folk can't see it. It happens. Um, anyway, the staff check that the number on that ballot paper matches the number on the envelope that it was in. Again, that's another wee check to make sure no one's been fiddling with stuff. And then they then check how many uh, valid ballot papers they have here. And again, they, they've not actually looked at the... Well, they're not taking any notice of what's on the ballot paper itself. It could still be a spoiled ballot, but it has to be a valid ballot paper. So as in, you know, the numbers had to match. So they take account, they, they take a note of that number as well. So at the end of this process, they know, you know, how many ballot papers are rejected at each stage. And then all these ballot papers are put into ballot boxes, uh, generally about 650 in a box, and they're stored securely to be counted on the night of the election, 10 p.m. Now, uh, that may be a bit boring, but it's just to kind of explain that there is a, you know, there's a, there's a process here and there are checks at each stage. And you'll see why I'll go into that in a minute. Because uh, basically, the, the postal voting agents like to observe this process and stand there and make sure that nothing's funny is going on. Uh, but the problem there is, if you're watching folk opening envelopes and you know ballot papers, sometimes you can see what's on a ballot paper, and you may be able to take note of what you are seeing in the ballot paper. So we we'll move on to the Ruth Davidson question. Because one of the ones that we hear the most about postal votes is, what about Ruth Davidson? She was looking at her postal vote in 2014, kind of thing. Now, the reality is, uh, in, a, in an election count, uh, activists like me stand and watch the ballot papers being counted. And we do this thing called ballot box sampling, which is where we try and take a note of the, you know, what the results are in that box. It's not for any kind of dodgy reasons. It's just that in future elections, we have an idea of where our support was. And this was done in the, the referendum as well, because it meant we could see which areas uh, voted yes, and which areas voted no. And it you know, helps in the future. Uh, you know, for future referendums, we know which areas we need to concentrate on and where our best areas are for, uh, to get folks to turn out and things like that. But this process also happens at the postal vote opening sessions, where the agents who are there, as I say, they can sometimes get an idea of what a ballot paper's uh, the X was next to. 
And when you've got a ballot paper that's only got a yes or a no, it's particularly easy because if the cost isn't on the yes, then it's probably in the no and vice versa. So if you're standing there and you're just looking at people opening them these ballot papers and you see them, it, you know, even if, well, you might have a clicker in both hands or something like that so that folk can't see you doing it. Or maybe you're just standing there with a board uh, tallying them. I don't know that's what we do in the, the full counts, but I don't think that's what they do in the ballot, uh, the postal ballot ones. But what Ruth Davidson said uh, on referendum night, this was 10.45 p.m., uh, and she was on TV, BBC, she said, the no campaign had people at every sample opening around the country and that the reports have been very positive for us. Now, all she was referring to there was the fact that they had postal vote agents at these postal opening sessions and that they were able to get an idea of what the results were from the, the ballot papers they were seeing. They weren't touching any ballot papers. Every single ballot paper they were looking at had already been cast by a genuine voter. It's just because they were there, it's scrutinising the process, and we had folk in doing the same thing, they were able to get an idea of uh, how their vote was going, you know? It didn't mean that they had, uh, in, you know, in, intercepted ballots. It didn't mean that the you know, MI5 had come along and chucked in some extra ones in all the ballot boxes. It just meant they were able to see what the ballot papers were saying, and that let them have an idea of how their election uh, campaign was going, referendum campaign. Um, now, she was actually uh, looked into by the police, but this wasn't because they thought that she'd done anything to postal voting, uh, postal votes, anything like that. Like, no one was ever, well, no one of any authority ever accused her of that. The reason she was looked into by the police was because the, uh, the act that put forward the referendum had a, uh, a section in it saying that you shouldn't be trying to ascertain uh, the results of those ballot papers at post vote on sessions and you shouldn't be telling it to other people. So, what, when you say Ruth Davidson in response to postal votes, all you're actually doing is referring to someone blurting something out on TV after the polls closed, which suggested that she had information that she probably shouldn't have had. Uh, and she was investigated for it, and she was cleared. I'm not surprised because, you know, let's face it, she does like to talk a lot of rubbish and big her stuff up. She could have just completely made this up just to sound cool on TV kind of thing. And in fact, she, you know, she said on TV that they had postal agents at every opening session in the country. It's known as a matter of fact that they didn't actually. So, you know, she lied about that. Maybe she lied about other stuff. Who knows? Or you know, let's say embellished rather than lie, because, you know, she might watch this and decide to sue me or something like that. Ultimately, that law was nothing to do with postal votes themselves. That was a law about trying to maintain the secrecy of the election as a whole. So it wasn't about her... She didn't touch a postal vote. If she did touch a postal vote, it's her own one. Uh, but the, getting information about postal votes that had already been cast doesn't affect what those postal votes actually say, if you get me. So that's... That's the kind of Ruth Davidson question, and I'm, I'm sure folk won't be completely satisfied with that, but that's, that's ultimately what happened there. Another thing that I often see is um, a reference, again, this is the referendum, um, folks saying that there was postal vote turnouts of 96% and that this is literally impossible because you couldn't possibly have 96% turnout because there's people who die, uh, people who move, you know, ultimately the electoral register couldn't possibly... It couldn't, you know, there would be changes to that, which mean you can pause out ninety-six percent on turnout because more than four percent wouldn't even be able to vote at, at that point. Now, this seems to come from this. They call this a report. It was, and it was a lot of rubbish, really. But this uh, thing from a group of people who decided to try and again find a reason for why we lost that was more palatable than the fact that we just didn't convince people that independence was the way to go. Um, so they're based in Argyll and Butte, and they noticed that the postal vote turnout in Argyll and Butte was 
And Acres kind of just decided that this was impossible. Um, if, if you ever read the report, I'm not going to say what the name is, I don't want the coach folk, but it, it's, it goes on about it being um, the highest turnout in the world, higher than North Korea, all, all this kind of stuff. All these claims that have absolutely no actual references to show that it's true. They just make them up. But they, there's a lot of things in this report that showed that they really didn't understand the, what they were seeing and they didn't have a lot of experience with the kind of run of elections. So they, they're just making lots of assertions. The, the main problem is that it was based on the central assertion that the electoral register is only updated once a year, which is why by the time of the election, you have all these differences to people's limits, ex, uh, you know, people dying and moving and stuff like that, that it would be out of date. But the reality is the electoral register is updated monthly. You, you have one electoral register that's published at the start of the year. So, for example, the, uh, the one for 2021 has just been... Uh, oh, you want me to get a Q&A soon? Okay. Uh, I can uh, wrap up soon, yeah. Um, so, yeah, basically, these people who made this claim about 96% turnout being uh, impossible didn't do even a basic kind of investigation about the fact that their assertions were based on falsehood, basically. Um, and also, if you can... Uh, Stacey talked about the numbers that we have that show us that postal vote turnout is so much better. In a normal election, the turnout in postal votes is about, can be about 20% or more in uh, reference to the overall turnout. So you might have 63% turnout in a vote, but a postal vote turnout is 85%. Now, if you take a referendum where overall turnout is 85%, you can't really go... Oh, you know, you can't go 22% higher, so that's 107% turnout. But 96% turnout is just 8% more than, say, 88% turnout, which is what it was in this area that had a 96% turnout. So that's not actually unrealistic at all. If, if the gap is usually 22%, 88% is actually quite normal. Uh, and these are all things that if the people who made the support, which then purported a lot of these myths, had actually kind of compared things to across the country and with other elections, they would realise that they were speaking rubbish. But they didn't do that because they wanted to cause uh, people to believe these myths, basically. Another one I often hear uh, is that postal votes get sent down to England to be counted, or at least they did in the referendum. And this is a claim that I, I spent a long time trying to find any evidence for this whatsoever, because I wanted to find out why people were saying it. And the only place I could find any any source for these claims was comment section on blogs, basically. And it, the reality is, this is the easiest one to kind of find out for yourself that's a lot of rubbish, because if you were to uh, register for a postal vote, you would see on your envelope what address it gets sent back to. And all postal votes go straight back to the council, because they want to get them as soon as possible. The reason this uh, myth came about is probably because the way councils deliver their postal votes, they contract a company called an electoral services company to send their postal votes out for them. Because why have 32 different councils uh, having their own very similar facilities to send out postal votes when you can just get the same company to do it for everyone? Uh, I mean, there, there are potential reasons uh, about, you know, like privatisation and stuff like that, why you shouldn't do it. But ultimately... These councils, they, um, you contact a company that sends out postal votes. That's based in England, but the postal votes themselves go directly back to the council. So there's no reason to think that your postal vote doesn't go straight back to the council. And if you register for one and you just look at the address on your envelope, you'll see that. So and that's the three kind of main ones that I see all the time. There's a lot of these mystics see going about. Uh, but the most important thing to remember and again, this is a particularly true the referendum, which is where all these myths come from. For that to have been, for any of these things to have gone wrong, it would have meant it had to be uh, it would have to be done with the complicity of the Scottish government. So the Scottish government that ran that referendum, and it's our Scottish councils that run elections. Uh, it's not the UK government that does that. You know, they don't tell councils who to contract for their electoral service stuff like that. The councils decide themselves. And the Scottish government set the rules for that referendum. So 
if you want, you know, the Scottish government was the people were the people who were most wanting a yes vote. If they didn't think there were all these issues that needs investigating, then why do we listen to the voices of random people online that we don't know? That's that's ultimately the thing. Um, Post voting secure. All political parties, even us, as in being Greens and all that stuff, back post the voting, and we all try and encourage folk to go and get signed up for it in the first place. So really, it, it's just in your best interest to do it. I, mean, I shall stop blabbering there. Thank you so much, Doug. And that was really insightful, taking us through the process, and Stacey reminding us why it's important that we need um, postal votes. Now, um, I'll just say to everyone on um, Facebook um, Live just now, we have an amazing turnout. We once peaked at 72, so we realise how important this discussion is um, to everyone. And at the end of this um, discussion, we hope you end up being um, one of these confident people, as you can see, we read Doug Daniel's um, blog, which was very interesting, went viral before. We hope that at the end, you'll be someone confidently shoving their postal vote into a post box. So at the end of this meeting, that's our aim. Um, that's what we want to try and impact here. And um, before we go on to Q and A, we have our own mini campaign video that we'd like to share with you as well. Um, that um, we are pushing around and we hope that you're able to share it with people. It's just a quick, snappy one just to show you about postal voting. So we'll just play it now. Okay, thank you for watching that. Um, the main takeaway here is we have COVID, we have the COVID issue, we also have bad weather up here. So in the interests of these issues and the fact that postal voting does actually win elections as we've seen in the US election, please sign up to a postal vote. But we understand that some people are hesitant, some people are quite, um, are unconvinced just now. But we have two very um, experienced people here, Doug and Stacey, and we will start um, fielding your questions to them. So we have some off Facebook, some on this chat, and um, I can see some names here. So I will call out names to give you the opportunity to ask a question um, live here, or um, please indicate if you would like um, me, the host, to ask the question. So um, the first person that I have here is um, Lynn Finlayson. Um, she says she lives two minutes away from a polling station. It's easy for me. Should I still consider a postal vote? And Doug or Stacey? Yes, I, I answered Lynn's comment in the, in the chat there and my view is very firmly yes, because you any circumstances could happen between now and then. You can still take your postal vote to the polling station if you enjoy that experience and you're fitting up and well enough and circumstances allow on the day. But having that backup plan is critical at this time, more critical than it's ever been. So my view is yes, don't consider it, do it. Thank you, Stacey. Doug, anything different or just the same? Uh, no, exactly the same. <laughs> Great, thank you. Okay, and um, I'll call on Ron Cully um, to ask his question, please, to the panel. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we had Mike Russell speak to a local branch, and I asked him the question about postal, ballot, uh, postal ballots, and he was kind of dismissive. And as with Doug saying, this is rubbish, and that's rubbish, and the next thing's rubbish. But I, 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 I want to ask myself, is it foolproof? Now, D Doug has described a very robust system, but the reason we've got a fraud squad in the polis is because people can... Uh, get involved with financial transactions, bank transactions, and make uh, make a meal of them. Um, so I, I just worry that, that, I mean, Doug said that there was a, a number, there are the problems I saw. And the, worry, the, the question I've got, what about the problems you don't see? The security services, England would lose so much if Scotland secured independence. It is inconceivable, inconceivable to me that they won't have the security services messing around with this uh, referendum. I'm not talking about the next election necessarily, although they may well do, but in the next uh, referendum, I cannot believe that the security services will not take a keen interest in that polling system. And although uh, Doug has described a very robust system, you, you said at some point, uh, Doug, that the, 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 and the boxes are then put into a room and locked away. What happens now that in, during the hours of darkness if there is a fraud squad to investigate fraud out there in the wider community, 
why can we not imagine that uh, it might be possible to interfere inappropriately with the, with the ballots? And with the system that you've discussed, discussed Douglas, not about you, the, the problems you see, but the problems you don't see. I asked about whether it's whether we're just too complacent. And that's all. Uh, no, I wouldn't say we're too complacent. I mean, there have been issues with the postal vote in, in uh, the past. It, it used to be too easy, uh, for example, to, to kind of do kind of things wrong about. The, the thing with the voting, the postal voting statement, for example, that was introduced because it was recognised that you did have to have something that made sure that you could tie uh, the vote to the previously, you know, the person that registered to it. Um, so that, there have been improvements to it. Um, but ultimately, the proof is in the pudding, really. It didn't really suit the, the, the British establishment for the SNP to win the 2011 election with a, uh, with a majority, it didn't suit them for the SNP to win 56 out of uh, 59 seats in 2015. Didn't suit them for us to win uh, 40 odd seats last uh, 2019. Why do they let us get these wins and then all of a sudden they decide to swing their, you know, their things in action to rig the postal vote this one time? Well, it, it just doesn't. David Cameron thought he was going to win the last one out of the park, and that's why he agreed in the first instance it should go ahead. Now he's looking at polls at 58%. Do you not think they're trying to do something to bring that back a bit? Just to just comment on a couple of points that Doug's already made. I mean, to add in the, the Brexit referendum, you know, it's clearly done absolutely no favours whatsoever to the Westminster establishment for us to have a different view from the, the other... Uh, United Nations of the United Kingdom. Um, a couple of points that, that I wanted to, to really clarify from the point of view of somebody who has been an election agent and, and sat through that process end to end. Now, what you're talking about in terms of people having access to various different parts of the system. So, for example, if somebody was able to get access to the signature files for everybody in a constituency, they would then have to have a fraud handwriting expert with a mad set of skills to be able to copy endless numbers of people's um, handwriting to the point that the person who sits and analyzes them, you know, if there is any slight discrepancy, so in the first instance, they're put through a reading machine. And if there is the slightest, tiniest discrepancy, the way the pen's turned, um, a slight blotch on the paper, even just something that the machine doesn't like the look of, it has to go to an individual for scrutiny. And the person who sits and scrutinises those signatures, certainly in, in my local um, post, postal voter uh, um, system, has been trained by forensic handwriting experts. And I'm sure that's the same up and down the country and every other postal voting count situation. And, and those people know their stuff. And you can sit there and they will talk you through it, right? So this one doesn't match on that point. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not accepting it. And it can be the tiniest little um, little inconsistency that means that actually that vote doesn't doesn't get counted as something that's significant. When you're talking about where boxes are, are locked away, again, I don't know what the situation is around the country, but certainly where, where I am here in Dumfries and Galloway, we have an underground bunker that things are kept in um, that you know is basically a Holocaust proof, uh, not Holocaust, um, completely bomb proof in every possible way you know it's 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 there in case of the end of days and nobody can access that apart from a very small number of key holders now those people are the people who are responsible for overseeing the process itself who would be dragged over hot coals if there was any issues who may i add also are voters who have political preferences themselves so it's worth bearing all these things in mind and just to reiterate the point that doug made relative to the argyle and butte postal vote count it's so easy for us as people who have have won and lost and won and lost but but lost really sorely lost really sorely something that we so passionately believe in work ourselves to the bone for one from 18th of september right the way through every day to now and and every day between now going forwards and when we finally get it it's so so hard for us to swallow the fact that we just didn't do enough and we just didn't win we need to change that going forward and the only way that we can do that is by putting our faith in these and in, in, in the voting process in the democratic process 
There is no way around it. Nobody else is subverting it. And we need to bite the bullet and, and accept that in order to move on and actually succeed in the way that we want to. Thank you very much, Doug and Stacey Francis. And thank you very much, Ron, for your um, interesting question. Um, because we're running out of time, we'll try and move on very quickly. Um, I have the next person, and that will be um, Stay. Sorry, it is. Sorry, I've lost the name there. Um, You've got Sarah. Yeah, Sarah Fanet. Thank you. Oh, good evening. Thank you for organising uh, this event. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, the question I was asking, I've been using postal votes for a long time and I always drop them in the polling station. But I was thinking of Stacey's um, uh, story today. You know, for example, I, I have to self-isolate on the day. Can I give it to someone to go and drop it in uh, the polling station? Is it something you would recommend? And also, is it something we could organise just in case we have a group of friends uh, uh, who cannot vote on the day, uh, we can go and get their postal votes. Is it something that we can consider? I don't, I don't know if Doug has a significantly different view from me. I, I kind of commented on this one in the, um, in the chat and I, I, would, I would need to go back and check the law. Um, I don't see why there would be any issue with me coming to collect yours and taking it along um, because you know it's handled by, by Royal Mail and you know there's nothing to stop me taking your postal ballot to the post box for you for example however I would want to double check before I advised anybody to do that I don't know how local um, polling stations might feel about me turning up with a stack of 20 for example and um, you know I think there is there is questions further questions that we need to, need to be asked both from an electoral law perspective that I, I don't have the information to hand. I should, but I don't. Um, um, it would also be important to maybe check with your local uh, electoral registration office as well, if that would be something that they would be um, comfortable with uh, taking receipt of at various different polling stations across the constituency on polling day. Um, I think this count is going to be, the, the polling situation in the count is going to be very different, so it may be that there's some discrepancy built into the process going forward, but definitely happy to look into that one and get back to you. Thank you very much. That's great, thank you. And Doug, do you want to come in at all or? No, nope. I think Susie's going to cover it there, yeah. Okay then. Um, the next question, I'm not sure about what this phrase is because it's escaped my head, but someone's asked on Facebook, um, do, but does IDOCS count? But does IDOCS not count the vote? Right. I'll take this one, shall I? Uh, I used to work for IDOCS. Uh, so uh, this one really annoys me. Um, IDOCS is a company that is, it basically a company I was talking about, actually based in England, um, one of us, I don't know if it's still the case, but one of us non-executive directors was uh, Peter Willey, who was an MP. Now, there's always an argument for why um, MPs should be serving on boards of companies. And while that's a good thing, uh, I'd say it's not, to be honest, but that's kind of a, a privatisation thing and a kind of um, giving contracts to mates kind of thing. Peter Willey, the Tory MP, who is a non-executive director of IDOX, is not able to go into the code base of IDOX and uh, you know change bits of code to say if vote equals SMP, make it Tory and things like that. You know, he didn't have the opportunity to do it. He didn't have the ability to do it, uh, and it would get noticed by people. But the, the, the reason I point out that I work for that company is to point out that uh, this this bogeyman that people have. There are people who used to work for it. There are people who still work for it, who support independence. And if you're trying to say this company is somehow involved in rigging elections, you're accusing people who support independence of helping rig elections. And it's not on, basically. And again, th this is exactly how these kind of theories come about. People find out one little bit of information, which is that some Tory MP is a non-executive director of a company. And from that, they decide, well, that means this. That means this, and that means this. Okay, so they they rig things. So uh, it, it's again, it's just it's exactly how these things come about. People find a lot of information, and from that, uh, flowers of myths bloom basically. But no, IDOX did not rig any elections. All they do is they produce. They they're the kind of folk who, for example, uh, sorry, I'm rambling. Stacey went on about how there's uh, machines that scan signatures, for example, right? So companies like this, and it's not just them, 
they produce these kind they, they provide these kind of pieces of machinery that help do that. Um, if you ever go to a local election uh, count, the machines that count the votes there are produced uh, provided by companies like this. They're just you know the the, so the things they provide stay with the council. They're not in England. It's not everyone's not going to England to get in count and stuff like that. They just provide services for folk, which in an ideal world, counters would be able to do themselves and not have to go to a private company to do it. But we are who we are, basically. But uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm ranting now because it really annoys me. Thank you, Doug. And Stacey, have you got any response to that at all? None whatsoever. Uh, I did like the comment in the chat, though, uh, asking if Doug was an MI5 infiltrator. Um, I think if he was, he's been ratted out uh, and probably he was on our side in the first instance. <laughs> all right, great. Thank you both. Um, so next I'll call on Joe McKenzie, um, the account is a long name, I'll, um, Joe McKenzie, to ask you a question. Yeah, what happens if your vote is invalidated because, or your envelope's invalidated because your signature is wrong? Do you get it's a not chance? counted. <laughs> not counted and you don't get a chance to vote at the polling station? No. Okay, thanks. It's it, there is a there is a lot of leeway in it though because as I say if you know my signature goes through the system and there's something slightly off about it this it's bounced back to the, the the forensic handwriting specialist who looks at it and says well actually quite a lot of that is similar it could be quite often you see it with older people who have maybe um, lost a bit of stability in in their um, in their, their means of writing so it's a, it's exactly the same but it's a bit wobblier than it than it was when they maybe applied for the vote um, so. The, the the expert you know tries their best to verify the vote to ensure that they line up but if you know they're they're clearly if if you signed my vote instead um they would see that there was a difference there and, and it would be rejected but you know if there was enough elements in it that it was clear that it was your handwriting pattern so it's not just about it looking the same it's about the pen strokes and um, you know something i'm personally quite fascinated in so it was really really interesting from my perspective to understand more of it um you know if if it meets enough of their criteria, it will be passed. But if it is substantially different, that it's obvious that it's been written by somebody else um, under their trained expertise, then, then it's rejected flat out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Doug, have you got anything to say? Uh, no, but like I say, that's why make sure that you sign it properly the first time. And if you don't, make sure you've kept a note of what you did. Uh, someone in the chat just saying there, uh, take a photo of his original signatures application form so you can copy it. So that's a good idea. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, Doug. Um, I'm just reading through some of the comments as well. Um, Calm Merrick says, significant fraud would require too many people who don't know each other to work in sync. And um, Stacey did respond indeed. So um, that does help in terms of the whole operations. That's flawed. Um, did have another name here. So someone asked um, Brian about phishing. Would you like to ask your question? Yeah, sure, thanks. I, my question just about the legality of, if you like, harvesting postal vote signatures. Um, we don't do, um, I'm from Mary and we, we don't do too well in the postal vote boxes. Uh, it's rumored, for example, that another party goes around old folks homes handing out forms and then you know click uh, and then recollecting these forms once they've been signed and almost acting as an agent for the postal vote so i just like to hear comments from the speakers about the, the legality and almost the morality of that as well yeah that's that's one i've heard uh, quite a few times myself brian as i said being down here in the deepest darkest south we have quite quite a large agent population um, and it is something that, that comes up quite regularly. Again, I would refer to the points that we've made about uh, being complicit. So, you know, for all of those older people that are, are being duped by this process, there would have to be all the other staff members, the owners of the care homes, um, you know, the other residents and, and their uh, associated family members who are complicit in that process. And that then puts it into the realm, in my mind, of conspiracy. You know, you're talking about a huge number of people being in on a process to subvert part, a, a, a relatively small part, albeit perhaps an effective part of the postal vote process. 
Um, I, I think it's it's probably quite unlikely. Um, you know, I wouldn't rule anything out in any circumstances. If, if it is happening, I would say it's probably on a very, very small scale because otherwise folk wouldn't get away with it. Um, you know, in, in a care home of 10 or more people, you're going to have a number of staff, family members, other people who have cognizance of, of what's happening and, and would take some sort of action to, to uncover that sort of behaviour, I would expect. Thank you, Stacey. Um, Doug, have you got any response to that? Uh, no, I'm, but ultimately it'd be against the law of folk were doing that. So I mean, if you ever find actual proof, uh, then totally report it, because it'd be great to get these parties, uh, and we know which one you're talking about, in trouble. But um, yeah, I, I've often wondered if it happens, but I've never seen actual proof of it. And yeah, ultimately it's, you'd have to be able to forge folk signatures as well. And that's, you know, it's, it's probably not going to happen, to be honest. All right. Thank you very much for your responses. And um, we have a very interesting comment here from Sandra um, off the back of what Stacey said. We in Inverclyde have analysed voting returns in the 2019 general election. The biggest non-return of postal votes was actually from care homes. Okay, that's interesting, Sandra. Um, we, one of our team members would like to ask um, how we can improve people's perceptions of postal vote security. Um, Stacey and Doug, do you have any advice for us, even as a campaign group? We're trying hard to do this. Yes, uh, practice what you preach. I think if we all sign up, and we all start voting in a positive way, we'll see the positive outcome of it. I mean, I think that's, the, you know, Doug used the phrase, the proof is in the pudding, and that very much is the case with this. Um, and another person in the comments had mentioned that they actually won postal votes in the general election uh, in 2019. And in my area, we saw a significant uplift. We, we didn't get as badly humped as we normally do in the postal vote. Um, so people are starting to put their faith in it. And the more people that do that, the more momentum we get behind it, the better view it's going to have, the more positive it's going to be. But I think you know, the best thing that we can do at this moment in time, if you're no certain, is look across the pond. <laughs> you know, we manage people power putting their faith in the postal vote system has managed to overthrow Trump and, and put Biden in, in place as president. While we're not quite talking about the same set of circumstances here, we are talking about the same concept. So, you know, take the leap, put your faith in it, and you will see the results. And that's all the positive proof you Excellent, Stacey, thank you. Any advice for us, Doug, as well? Um, I suppose, as Stacey says, uh, pass what you preach, uh, which I should probably do, because I don't actually have a postal vote, because uh, I very much enjoy going up to port, uh, the station and do not cross as hard as I possibly can. Uh, but I'm thinking of signing up for one this time, to be honest, because exactly for the reasons that Stacey's been saying, in that, like, you could get told the day before the election, oh, you've got to self-isolate, and then, oh no, I then can't vote against the baddies, kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, uh, basically anyone who hasn't been vaccinated by, you know, a, a few weeks before election day should probably really, really strongly consider making sure they've got a postal vote uh, so they can actually vote uh, and, and not be a victim of COVID or something like that. Uh, but yeah, that is very true because this, um, as we've seen, COVID is unpredictable. Um, some of us might feel, oh, we'll just pop out tomorrow. I live very close, and you might find yourself in a situation where you might not be able to go out. You might not even be able to reach someone to vote for you. So, and applying for emergency postal vote is not as is not always easy or the best. I wouldn't. I say it's, you're taking a semi risk to be honest. So, um, I would really encourage everyone to apply for a postal vote. And um, Jim has actually some a few suggestions he says about improving perception and um, Jim let's hear them. Um, I must admit I had uh, been involved in uh, monitoring the count for the referendum and um, where I was it turned out the postal vote would have to be in about 80 percent or something to to achieve the result and it, so I was kind of against the postal vote but then I realized that a lot of postal voters it might be a higher proportion of older people who are more likely to have voted no and also I think at that time the unionists were pushing the postal vote a lot harder so that could well have accounted for that. What I feel is I, I did monitor, um, I was an agent for the postal vote and I think what would be helpful is if 
the people who were monitoring it had clear written guidance based on what they were allowed to do, um, the kind of things to look out for and that kind of thing. And as I think either Stacey or Duke had mentioned earlier, if people know that we are sitting there monitoring these things carefully and looking out for stuff, they're much more likely to feel uh, that things are being looked after properly and it's more secure. Um, one of the things that is mentioned in polling stations is when you go in in the morning at seven o'clock, people can, agents can view the box as being empty before it's sealed and ready for putting votes in. But that isn't really mentioned in the postal voting and it didn't happen when I was viewing it. So if I had known that I was entitled to do that, then I would have known to do that. So I think things like that, you know, how to monitor it and people knowing. And also the other thing is making sure that we have a good number of people who are going to act as agents, given how big the postal vote is, it might extend over a quite, quite a long period. So if we make sure we've got enough people to do that, I think that would help a lot. Thank you very much for that, Jim. Really appreciate that. Um, just um, picking up on Colm's um, point about Trump. Um, it's true, without postal votes, and Trump might have won, because for many of us, who I'm, who I'm sure many of us here, were watching the US elections, and the Democrats did really well because of postal votes. And closer to home, I've been at an election count as well. The last general election count I was there, I saw at my counting table, the postal votes were doing, it was really helping the unionists and um, they were doing really well in the postal votes. And as soon when we started counting um, the ballots that came from the polling station, then you could see a shift towards um, our side. But if we, if we could encourage our side to also in, increase their postal vote, it will also in, include, an, in, it will also increase voter turnout, sorry. So it's very important that we recognize that this distrust is actually helping unionists where they do really well in that. So if they can get their votes counted, if they can do so well in it, then what's our distrust? And we're so, and it's really helping them to be honest, I'll just say that. And um, so I'll go over to Kathleen to ask her question. She's got quite an important one because I think people are hesitant because they're not really sure whether their vote will make it from the beginning to the end. So Kathleen, um, can you ask your question please? Yeah, I'm just wanting to know how I know that my postal vote hasn't got lost in the system. How do I know it's actually been, you know, received at the council office and is actually being counted? Is there any way that you can prove that it's been accepted? Uh, so I, I don't actually know for sure. I, I imagine you could probably phone up and check. But one thing I do know, um, as activists, uh, we get these things called... Uh, marked up registers, which we get after an election, where you can see who's voted. You get a line through someone's, because well, when you go to vote, uh, folks strike a, a line through your name to show you voted. We're allowed access to that, so we can get an idea of who's voting and who's not, so we know, you know if someone never votes, we don't bother annoying them. Um, as part of that, you can see which postal votes were sent back and which weren't. It doesn't tell you who they voted for, so you know, no worry about that, but it tells you who did or didn't return their postal vote. So they do have information. Um, so, I mean, you can sort of find out afterwards. Uh, beforehand, um, to be honest with you, I'm not sure. I've never looked into it. So I'm hopefully giving Stacey enough time to have uh, found out something. Um, I wasn't looking anything up there, if I'm honest, Doug. Um, I think that uh, everybody's postal vote has a unique identifier on it. Um, it also will have your electoral registration number on it. And as Doug rightly says, there's obviously the marked up register is produced after the event. But as your paperwork goes through the system, that then scores you off the system so that the system knows that you have voted and um, so that somebody else can't come along and pretend to be you uh, thus creating a process of fraud so that you know that piece of paper with your signature on it um, will then your new signature will go into the system uh, and within your file so that information will be held you would have access to that under any sort of freedom of information uh, regulation so you know a call to your electoral registration office maybe a week after you've posted it off just to make sure it's it's there if you're if it's something you're concerned about it shouldn't be an issue 
Thank you very much, Stacey and Doug, for your answers there. Um, I'll just pick up Sandra's point quickly because it'll give, it'll give you something to think about. She said the strongest Tory voting area in Inverclyde had the highest proportion of possible votes in the general election, the last general election. So that really gives you something to think about how it helps unionists. Um, we also have Maureen Watt, who's the MSP for Aberdeen South and North King Cardin, who was on the committee considering changes to the postal voting. So I'll just um, call on Maureen just to give us a few words as well about this topic. And thank you, Maureen. Oh, right, uh, Fatima, thank you very much. Just on that last question, um, Doug can correct me if I'm wrong, because he's been an election agent. Uh, I haven't, but... Um, it's true to say that political parties get lists of postal voters. Um, so you could check with the political parties. Is that not correct? Yeah, I think that would work, yeah. Yeah, OK. Uh, yeah, I was just um, messaging Fatima to say that I was on the committee that recently brought in um, new uh, legislation and procedures in relation to um, uh, an election during a uh, uh, coronavirus um uh, pandemic and one of the things that will change is the length of time that you can uh, apply for a postal vote so it's three weeks before the election now rather than nearer than it was before um, so that is to make sure that all the applications can be um, verified and also that the votes as they come in can be uh, verified before um, election day so you know if you're applying for a postal vote please do it as soon as you can when you get your postal vote send it back um, as soon as you can um, so that the uh, electoral registration officers the counting uh, officers have got enough time um, to go through and verify everything before they actually go to the count uh, on the night because we do not really want any delays on that it's terrifying waiting to see as a candidate I can tell you waiting to see uh, what the re the result will be um, so I, th I think that's really important and in terms of I noticed in the chat box somebody said that you should you might take a, a photo of how you've filled in or written your signature because if for example you know I was to write Maureen E Watt instead of just Maureen Watt um, they might um, reject it um, for that. So it is really important um, that you have the same uh, um, signature uh, on, on both things. Um, just other things, changes that you might be interested that are going to happen in terms of a COVID safe election. Um, the number of electors in each polling um, district will be um, shortened so there'll be more polling booths with inside the polling station so polling, more polling places with inside the polling station or is it the other way around I never get it right um, so that there's not so many long queues and um, there will be you know maybe longer spaced queues uh, within the polling stations uh, themselves all those things are being considered by um, the electorate election management board um, and as I say the, the biggest message I want to put forward is that apply early and vote early um, because the um, electoral registration officers when they came to give us evidence said that the maximum they could probably cope with in terms of po uh, postal votes is 40 percent so of the total electorate so that's still a hell of a lot um, but it is important uh, to apply early and vote early. Thanks, Fatima. Thank you very much for that, Maureen. What? Um, so main message, apply early, vote early, um, in order to ensure that you're exercising your democratic right. So I'll take one last person. Just check, Lorraine. Um, would you like to ask your question? Hi there. It was more an observation, really. Um, but I think if you weren't scored off as a postal voter, if for some reason, you know, your postal vote application hadn't made it in, you should still be able to go um, on polling day and cast your vote. Because it should be scored off, as Doug said, you know, and if it wasn't, then the vote is still available. I don't know if is that right. Does anybody know? 
I I don't know, Lorraine. I would have to double check that. I I my understanding um, would be that if you're a postal voter, you have to return a postal vote, but rather than use a ballot. But it might be that if it hasn't been scored off, you could make a quick call and, and arrange for an emergency vote um, at your polling station. So it would have to be one I would have to double check and come back to you. I'm afraid. Okay. Thanks. Doug, have you got any response or? Uh, no, but what I was going to say, um, Greg from Yes Sterling just put something out, uh, and I've seen his videos, they're very good. Uh, look for the Yes Sterling videos on postal voting on YouTube, because they, there's a, I think there's at least two of them, and they're absolutely fantastic, actually. Better than what I've said, to be honest. Uh, so. Yeah, can I get um, Greg, um, just to share, sorry, um, Jerry, yeah? Can you talk about what you're doing just now, the videos and the contents of it as well? Um, if you don't mind sharing the link in our mess in underneath the video on Facebook as well, that would be great. Uh, yeah, me and Greg, uh, well, there's two contexts. There's the Yes Sterling and there's the SNP. Greg and I worked together on the Yes Sterling stuff then. We learned from the 2014 election. Uh, we saw the ballot boxes uh, and the postal votes getting weighed in in Stirling. I've been at Counts in Albert Hall for uh, the last 30 years and uh, we vowed that night we've never been in that situation again. Uh, and we've worked from 2014, worked hard to get the postal votes up. Uh, we don't really get distracted by internet, if we're quite honest, because a lot of people on the internet will never trust the postal vote system. Our experience is if you go out and we target our areas where we know there's a strong independence vote, but we know the turnout is low, so we have, we have scrupulously targeted areas to sign people up for postal votes. Uh, and I know it's going to be hard now with the COVID restrictions, but you've got to get that message out. Um, you take 1999 when Bruce Crawford got elected here in Stirling, it was 1.9% of the vote was postal votes. 1.9%. Last year when Alan Smith got elected, 21% of the votes cast was postal votes. So even if you don't trust them, you don't get any choice. Uh, I heard Maureen make the comment about the electoral officers being a bit worried if it gets up to 40%. The Electoral Commission are anticipating there will be 50% of the votes cast this election will be by postal votes. So there's a big... Uh, the, the, I don't really get tied down with you. Doug and Stacey have both made good, uh, good uh, references to the myths around 2014. I'll, I want to say in 2014, I watched the ballot box, boxes getting opened across Stirling. And the one observation I'll make is it's not to do with postal votes, it's where disposable income was. The minute you moved out in an area, and we're not talking about millions, the minute you moved out in an area where there might have been post office accounts with £500 in the bank, the yes vote started to drift away. Now, if anybody thinks the British establishment is that good that they can set up a model to infiltrate individual ballot boxes on a geographical basis, right, we lost the referendum in 2014 because of the economic argument in my mind. And I saw it unfold. When you work hard, we now anticipate we now anticipate winning every postal ballot in Stirling. So maybe MI5 and MI6 have given up trying to infiltrate us. We we win the postal ballots here in Stirling. We would be shocked if we didn't. Going back to the references, we check the marked up registers afterwards. We check the marked up registers against the people who have registered for postal votes. Right? That's how thorough we are. I'm guessing that most of you here are activists. The people who are people who are concerned with postal vote, you've got to realize, as activists, we work damn hard to get you to vote. We ain't going to let anybody steal your vote lightly. It's just not going to happen. On polling, going back to the referendum, I had 140 polling agents in the referendum. Right? There was 40 people monitoring the count. We, we, the nearest, uh, the, the referendum wasn't stolen from us. We lost it. That's it. And you go watch your, watch your videos. The videos, are, the videos are a wee bit of fun. They're aimed at people who are a bit doubtful. Uh, we try and tackle all the myths, but we try and do it in a light-hearted way because, to be honest, there's no point in waste. If people really believe that the postal votes were taken down to London, steamed open, votes taken out, and no votes put back in, the envelopes resealed, then posted back up to Stirling and counted as a no vote, then we ain't going to convince them otherwise. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That's excellent. Thank you very much, Jerry. Jerry from Yes Sterling. So please head over to their YouTube and watch their um, videos as well. I'm going to take a look at their videos after this. Um, Tima, yeah. A, a huge thing that people um, maybe they need to remember 
when it comes to the postal voters, we um, I've just done a video as well. You can you can watch that. We're just re-editing it as well. And it's um, Bruce Crawford, MSP. It's Alan Smith, um, uh, MP, and Evelyn, who's our our, our uh, candidate uh, here, because uh, Bruce is stepping down, of course. Um, and they're all asking. There's a video of them asking you to get a postal vote. And the one thing that people need to remember is these are the people who rely on your vote. And if you would expect these people at the very centre of it, it's their their job, their position count uh, counts on it. You would expect that they, you know, if there was a problem with it, they'd be the first people to say, you know, don't don't go there. But they aren't. That 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 they're asking you really very very strongly to get your postal vote because we know that it, that it works and still and that that for me is the overarching argument <laughs> or a very strong argument anyway to get people to use a postal vote and i'll put some links up for the other stuff actually as well thanks yeah. thanks for having me. thank you thanks everybody great to have you guys here as well um so i'll reiterate jerry's point we activists will not want to waste will not work very hard just for you to waste your vote which is absolutely true so um we are really pushing the postal vote because we do know it works and this mix around it is just um, only helping the unionists. And um, I'll reiterate Maureen Watts' um, point as well, that please apply early, please get your um, application in early so that you can vote early as well. So we will, I can see a few people have asked on Facebook um, how to apply. So we will drop the link to that under the comment section and we will also post it on our main page. Our video will remain on um, Facebook, so please share far and wide. So with that, I'd just like to thank everybody for coming to this um, co this discussion. This is the, um, the first um, event, um, which is part of our wider campaign to get more people signed up um, to do so, to sign up to vote through postal. And we need to consider the pandemic. We need to consider that postal voting actually helps with increase voter turnout and it ensures that you exercise your democratic right to vote. We also recognize that as a pro-independence group, um, this is a crucial election for us to win independence. And for that, we need more votes and we're gonna get that through postal votes. So please spread the word. Please encourage people to go for postal voting as an option rather than any other option above all options. And um, thank you very much. And um, can I just check any last words from um, Doug, Stacey, I'll include Maureen as well. Any last words um, before we sign off? Postal vote. Postal vote. I'll second that postal vote. Any last words from Maureen as well, who's actually part of the um, committee as well? Yeah, uh, I mean, just to um, reassure everybody whether they want to vote by post, which obviously I would recommend, but even if they want to go in person, that it will be safe and secure and nobody's going to interfere with it. Excellent. And on that note, um, thank you very much, everyone. And, and that's it for our first series. And please stay tuned for more from our campaign um, about postal votes. Thank you, everyone. Bye. You've been listening to the Yes Group Spotlight programme this week, brought to you courtesy of the Aberdeen Independence Movement AIM. Uh, team here at Indie Live Radio would just like to say thanks very much to them for allowing us to record and rebroadcast their event. It's a really important thing to get as many of us signed up to use postal votes as possible, especially in the current set of circumstances. So hope you get out there and get yourself registered. Once again, thanks Aberdeen Independence Movement. <laughs>